200 years ago, Everly Scalawar was born here in Paris. Just 20 years later, he was dead, killed in a mysterious duel. But before he died, he would revolutionise mathematics, creating work of incredible insight and subtlety, founding modern algebra. In his short life, Everest would challenge the mathematical establishment, fight the monarchists that were crushing Paris and die in a duel over his first love. It was a life of passion, of genius, a life, a life well lived, but it ended in terrible pain and tragically young. We started here, where Everest's father was mayor of bourg le -Ven. now a suburb of Paris. He was a supporter of Napoleon and democracy, a proud Republican, with a passion for politics that his son would inherit. But Everest's passion for mathematics was not inherited. It developed at the Lycée Louis Le Grand, a school that had produced Robespierre and Victor Hugo. Here, Everest devoured the latest mathematical research as others would read in a novel. Soon, he abandoned all his other studies in favour of maths. And by the age of 17, he had published his first academic paper in continued fractions. From there, he turned his adventurous mind to the unsolvability of the quintic and whether we can determine if any given equation is solvable. To crack this solvability problem, Everest introduced the seminal concept of a group and formulated a new branch of algebra, known now as Galois theory. At 17, he submitted two memoranda containing his radical ideas to the Academy of Sciences and prepared himself for the entrance exams to prestigious École Polytechnique. But tragedy was to throw Everest's life off course. Just weeks before his crucial exam, his father committed suicide. By now, a king was back on the throne of France. And Republicans like Everest's father were being persecuted and harassed out of their positions. Sensitive Republican Nicolas Galois chose suicide. Distraught and distracted, Everest sat his university exam just two weeks later. The exam itself was undertaken by two mathematicians who have gone down in history for being the men who rejected Galois. At one point, they asked Everest to outline the theory of arithmetical logarithms and he promptly refused, insisting there were no arithmetical logarithms. When they failed to understand his unorthodox methods and reasoning, he threw the board duster at one of them. Needless to say, they failed him. Apocryphal the story may be, but Everest failed, and a growing sense of persecution at the hands of lesser mathematicians began to eat away at him. A sense of persecution that wasn't helped when the Academy of Sciences managed to lose the memorandums he had submitted. And adding insult to injury, they lost his entry for the Grand Prix of Mathematics. With judges among the greats of mathematics, such as Poisson and Lacroix, winning the prize would give the teenager a final chance to penetrate the closed world of Parisian maths. But Fourier, one of the judges, took every century home, died unexpectedly and Everest's work was never judged. The paper he submitted on the condition that an equation be solvable by radicals has subsequently been described as one of the most inspiring masterworks in the history of mathematics. Today, we may understand his maths and appreciate its subtleties, but in his own time, Everest struggled to have his ideas taken seriously and felt he was the victim of a conservative mathematical establishment. And it wasn't just in the field of mathematics that Everest clashed with conservatives. As a passionate Republican, on occasions he'd been kept in school to stop him from joining pro-democracy demonstrations. After a while, the school authorities got tired of trying to restrain him and eventually expelled Everest for his Republican activities. This did not deter Everest. With no school routine, no father, no clear future to restrain him. Everest became more politically active and increasingly dangerous to the authorities. At a dinner for the leading Republicans, including Alexander Dumas, he publicly threatened to kill the king and was duly arrested. At his trial, the 19-year-old was so defiant the judge tried to stop Everest from talking for his own safety. The judge needn't have worried. The jury was made up of Parisians and they found the young Republican not guilty and set him free. 
But just one month later, he was arrested again. Armed and dressed in the band uniform of the National Artillery, he was part of a large group crossing the Point North, hoping to take part in a hoped-for people's uprising. The uprising never happened. The monarchy survived, and only two people were arrested that day. And one of them was Everest Galois. This time, the authorities would not give a jury of ordinary people the chance to acquit him. He was held in prison for several months before a judge sentenced him to six months for wearing a band uniform. They were determined to see the young fireband in jail and broken. They almost succeeded. In dreadful prison conditions, Everest had to survive a flirtation with alcoholism, assassination and his own attempted suicide. But survive he did. And towards the end of his sentence, Everest was transferred to a convalescent home. Ironically, it was moving here that marked the beginning of the end for Everest. He met a young woman. Passionate and persecuted, and totally inexperienced, Everest misjudged the relationship. And when his advances were finally rejected, his bitter response drew a challenge to a duel. Historians now believe they know the identity of the woman, but they still debate on the identity of the men involved. Whoever they were, Everest did not expect to survive the encounter. The night before the fight, he gathered his mathematical papers together and summarised his ideas. He wrote three letters. The first was to all Republicans, almost an apology for not dying for the cause. The second letter was to his friends, begging them for forgiveness because he didn't tell them about the duel, for his challenges had sworn into secrecy. The third was an incredible summary of his radical mathematics, containing earlier ideas, new ideas, and some ideas that today have still not been deciphered. And as dawn broke on May 30th, 1832, before leaving for the duel, Everly scrawled his last words. Je n'aime pas le temps. I have no time. He was right. He died from a single shot. It was a painful death from a stomach wound. And he survived a full day, long enough for his brother to be at his side and hear Everest's last words. Don't cry. I need all the courage to die at 20. This much we know. But so much mystery surrounds the circumstances of the duel that conspiracy theories are legion. Was he worked into a duel by his political enemies? Enemies that were happy to see him almost destroyed in prison. Enemies that used his own passionate nature against him on his release. Was he trying to commit suicide by duel? Abandoned by his father? Ignored by his mathematical peers? Rejected by his woman? Or was Everest simply burnt out and feeling finished at 20? Was he trying to use his own death so that fellow Republicans could meet en masse at his funeral? and sparked the revolution that he so desperately hoped for. Thousands did attend and police did make arrests, but no revolution followed. He was a radical mathematician, a revolutionary Republican, and a passionate young lover. Cruelly thwarted by the conservative establishment and killed by the conventions of his time, what could he have achieved if he had lived? So for me, perhaps the greatest conspiracy of all is why is this, this genius who lived such an amazing life and who added so much to the sum of human knowledge not better known?